episode of the Health Tree Podcast for Multiple Myeloma, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. We'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Takeda Oncology, for their support of this program. Now, today is the first program with a new name, changing the program name from Myeloma Crowd Radio to Health Tree Podcast for Multiple Myeloma. Uh, we'll be making a more broad announcement about more name changes coming soon as we move our program names over to the Health Tree names. Uh, We're doing this just to simplify everything because I think we've thoroughly confused everyone between Myeloma Crowd and our Health Tree products. Um, Now, before we get started on today's show, I want to mention that we will be, because it relates to today's show, we'll be launching a three-year CAR-T study uh, relatively soon. So if you have received CAR-T therapy and you want to join that study to share your experience with others and see what we can learn together, you can get started by creating a Health Tree Cure Hub account today. Our health te- our team can help gather your records and put your myeloma history into a single place. This is a very helpful way for you to track your myeloma where we can help you collect your information from multiple treatment centers. And there are also additional benefits that you get by using the Health Tree Cure Hub. But once you have that in place, when we're ready to share the CAR-T survey questions, we'll know- er- notify everybody by email and you can share your experience in that survey. We want to do this because we're curious to answer important questions for patients like who benefits the most from CAR-T therapy, Um, maybe what's done pre- and post-treatment to make it more effective, are there genetic markers or patients that respond better to CAR-T therapy, Um, like other questions like what was your experience like in the process or your caregivers, what your your side effects might have been and the severity, um, and, and other things. So if this becomes a key treatment in myeloma, these are very, very important answers we all need to have. So you can get started today and go to healthtree.org forward slash myeloma and click on Cure Hub in the top left green menu bar. So now on to our show. As we all know, CAR-T treatments are becoming more widely used and more popular, having truly unprecedented response rates for highly relapsed patients. The two approaches that are FDA-approved today include a BECMA made by BMS and CARVICD made by Janssen Oncology. These two CAR-T products target BCMA and are both called autologous CAR-T therapies, meaning that you use your own T cells to make these treatments. But many um, And many new autologous CAR-T options, including a BECMA and CARVICD, are currently in clinical trials to see how they can be used in earlier lines of therapy for high-risk patients and so on. But a new host of allogeneic CAR T cell products, and I'm going to have Dr. Berdeha explain that later, are now in development. And for today's show, we have CAR T myeloma expert, Jesus Berdeha, of the Sarah Cannon Research Institute. So, Dr. Berdeha, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jenny. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and to the Myeloma Crowd family. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. Uh, let me give an introduction for you before we get started. Um, Jesus Berdeja is the Director of Multiple Myeloma Research Program and Senior Investigator or hematologic malign- of Hematologic Malignancies Research at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute. He is a partner at Tennessee Oncology as well. He is Chair of the Myeloma Working Group at Sarah Cannon and is a member of the Medical Informatics Committee, Myeloma Intergroup Committee, and Clinical Trials Network, member of the Plasma Cell Working Group, with CIBMTR, steering committee member on the Takeda Insight Study, a member of the International Myeloma Working Group, and a member of the CAR-T Working Group. He's also the myeloma co-chair of the VIA Pathways Multiple Myeloma Medical Oncology Committee and member of committees for both ASH and ASCO. He has provided peer review on many publications for over 15 major journals in blood cancers and has published extensively on myeloma topics and in the last decade has been a key principal investigator for myeloma trials with a special early focus on CAR-T technologies. I think you were one of the first to run some of these CAR-T trials, so I know your experience is, is deep and wide. So, Dr. Berdeja, maybe we want to start by having you explain the difference between autologous CAR-T therapies and allogeneic CAR-T therapies. Uh, yes, no, I think I think that's actually a good start. So um, an autologous CAR T uh, requires that uh, we collect T cells from the person that can receive the CAR T themselves. Uh, so you have to. It's it's very similar to the process of going through an autologous stem cell transplant, where you have to go collect cells first before you go through the procedure. So the same thing here with the CAR T. 
where you undergo leukophoresis to collect your T cells, then those T cells are taken back and the CAR Ts are manufactured out of those T cells. That process takes several weeks and then the, the product can be given back to, to the patient um, and that's the autologous process. The allogeneic CAR T, on the other hand, um, does not require that the patient undergo leukophoresis. The allogeneic product actually is, is manufactured from, um, from uh, volunteers uh, who donate to their T cells who, who presumably are healthy and have uh, no cancer, have not had chemotherapy, et cetera. So presumably a, a relatively intact uh, T cell um, source. And so by doing so, those T cells are taken from the donor and several products can be manufactured from that one donor. Uh, and so the allogeneic CAR-T product is actually available off the shelf, very much like the bispecific antibodies or other drugs would be. Uh, so theoretically, uh, if a patient is going to go on allogeneic CAR-T, the time to receive the therapy would be much faster than the time it would take uh, to actually receive an autologous CAR-T product. Yeah, that would be a major advantage, I would think. So how do you, do you want to explain fundamentally how the allocar T therapies work? I know it might be similar to how current CAR T therapies work, but maybe walk through that process for those of us who may not be that familiar with CAR T. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's um it's actually theoretically it's very similar. Um but there are actually quite a few challenges. So so when you take your own T cells and you manufacture CAR T's, and then those T cells are given back to you, your body knows those T cells, it sees them as self. And so those T cells don't necessarily get destroyed. And at the same time, those T cells are not going to cause any damage to your body because they know it as self uh, and, and really just go in and do what they have to do with this new CAR antibody that basically sort of sends them directly to your myeloma cells and destroys. When you're using an allogeneic T cell, it means that the T cell is coming from a different donor. And so, if, just to put it in perspective, when we do transplants um, and we do allogeneic transplants using a different donor, uh, one of the challenges is finding that donor to match uh, the patient. And the reason you have to match is because if you give T cells from a different donor to a patient and those are not matched, those T cells will actually see the patient as foreign and can actually attack and cause this, this um, very severe side effect called graft-versus-host disease, uh, which can be lethal. At the same time, the patient's own immune system may not recognize those T cells and actually go after them and destroy the T cells themselves. So because of that, in this case, we're, we're, uh, we're not typing uh, the donor. So, uh, so the T cells that are being used for allogeneic CAR Ts are actually not typed. So you have to basically do further manipulations to those T cells in order to prevent the two processes that I just mentioned, which uh, can be catastrophic. And so because of that, uh, the allogeneic products undergo much further manipulation. So aside from putting in the CAR, uh, most products then remove also the T cell receptor, which is, which is what mediates the graft versus host potential, and then you actually then have to do and manipulate um, a, a different entity, which is the HLA moiety or CD52, which potentially prevents your own T cells from destroying the CAR T product. So, so because of that, um, there's 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 a lot more that has to be done to these. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's yeah, interesting information about how they're processed because. You're not trying to, like what you're saying, you're not trying to match based on patients. Um, you're just trying to make the product work for everybody. Yeah, because imagine yeah. If, if you have to match, then it becomes very similar to no, the autologous terrible. product, right? That you have to wait <laughs> right. and you have to do all this matching. Right. Whereas the, mm -hmm. the plus of not matching is that you can have one donor and make, you know, hundreds of right. products, which is really nice. How do they so, pick so the donors? That's the difference. That's a, that's a question. Like, so, yeah. So these are, these are usually people who volunteer, um, and mm -hmm. then they're vetted uh, in terms of you know to make sure they're healthy and uh, that they can undergo the leukophoresis and um, 
I, I suspect, you know, the different sort of sponsors have different uh, incentives uh, for people. Uh, it's possible they, you know, they might get compensated in some way for, for their time. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's really not too dissimilar from when someone donates blood or is willing to sort of sign up um, to donate bone marrow. Um, it, it, I, I guess it's that same sort of kind of approach uh, to the to, to the to the volunteer slash donor. Yeah, I know for allo um, stem cell transplant, I had an investigator talking about how they're trying to use younger donors, you know, because, like, if you're trying to find even a sibling match, a younger donor might be actually better than an older sibling match. So hopefully Correct. they're choosing younger donors with very healthy T cells. Yes, no, yeah, it, it is. And, 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 and also, you know, from a donor standpoint, usually uh, young males are preferred to females, um, uh, especially if they've been pregnant, um, because whenever you get, you know, whenever you become pregnant, obviously you get exposed to to a foreigner, right? That's the baby, um, and so you mm -hmm. actually can make antibodies uh, against baby, and so because of that, female donors tend to have more antibodies potentially um, uh, that could lead to to, to uh, more rejection, um, and so and so usually, uh, ideally, you pick a young uh, male healthy volunteer. That's so interesting. Okay, and then when, once they're made, how are they stored and, you know, like how long can you keep them? How What's the shelf life? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So so luckily, um, you know, the uh, the allogeneic T-cells is no different than the autologous T-cells so from that standpoint um, and all the stem cell products. So uh, these cells can be, uh, uh, they're frozen, they're cryopreserved, uh, and uh, can be stored for many years. Um, so it's uh, it's you know the the FDA will always put sort of a a shelf life or an expiration date, um, but the truth is uh, that that's sort of it, it, it's almost like it's it, it, it's it's necessary, but there's no reason why a product that's older than what the FDA says can't be given. Um, similar to when you kind of if you go through a second transplant, for example, and you had your stem cells. Uh, stored uh, many many years prior, uh, those stem cells are fully functional, so uh, so they can last many years. Mhm, mm interesting. So in general, do you want to? We'll talk about dosing a little bit later, but um, do you want to give an overview of what you see as the potential advantages and disadvantages of autologous CAR T versus allo CAR T? I mean, you talked about having an off-the-shelf option which is faster, um, but in general, how are you looking at it as a myeloma investigator? Yeah, so, you know, I think, just to back up a little bit, I think um, uh, most most of you who are listening probably have seen data coming out, uh, obviously with the autologous CAR-T that Jenny mentioned earlier, but then you probably also heard of the bispecific antibodies. Um, and so the bispecific antibodies uh, are, are similar in that they're also causing T cell redirection um, to kill the myeloma cells, uh, and these are off-the-shelf products. And so one of the benefits of the bispecifics is that they're off-the-shelf, they're available, they're not manufactured when the patient's identified, you can get them uh, faster. Um, one of the disadvantages, though, with the bispecifics is that these are antibodies that have to be given, continuously given, and so uh, it, you, you move away from the one-and-done potential of the CAR T to now having to undergo treatment every week, every two weeks, every three weeks, depending on the product. And so the allogeneic CAR T, in my mind, if it works as well as the autologous CAR T, sort of takes the best of both worlds. It becomes that one and done product like the autologous CAR T, but it's also off the shelf and it's readily available. And so the autologous CAR T, the biggest benefit is that we know it works and it works incredibly well, right? We've seen uh, in excess, in, in some products even, you know, an excess of 90% response rates that are looking very, very durable, um, which, you know, responses and durations that we haven't seen in, in patients who yeah. are rarely uh, refractory. Um, <clears throat> so that's the plus. The minus is that there's several sort of roadblocks to get to it. One of them is, first of all, you have to you have to collect the T cells. So unfortunately, some people get certain treatments right before their CAR T cells or before the T cells are collected, 
that could potentially uh, damage their T cells, and so in, not enough T cells may be circulating to be able to manufacture the product, or the T cells don't function as well because of all these prior therapies uh, that have been given. And so that's one of the drawbacks of autologous CAR T. The other is that once you collect the T cells, the T cells, the CAR Ts now have to be manufactured. And so that manufacturing process takes some time. But as we're seeing with, uh, especially with some of the commercial products, is that there, there are these, you require these viral vectors to make the CAR Ts. And so those actually were, uh, uh, were, were in back order uh, and, um, and there was, um, um, there, there, there were a lot of delays uh, in the manufacturing of the product because of it. And so you're dependent because it's, it's on demand. So when the patient gets identified, then the product is made. The product is then available for the patient mm. then. And so, mm -hmm. so while you're waiting for your CAR-T, there's a potential that your myeloma can progress, it can get worse, and you know, if it hurts certain organs, it might make you ineligible to receive that CAR-T later on. So these delays are, you know, are not just sort of kind of annoying, they're actually potentially dangerous. Um, and so, and so you know, th that's the downside. The further downside is that the autologous CAR T's, um, well, it's a plus and a minus, expands so well inside the patient um, that we see very high rates of cytokine release syndrome and, 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 then, and, then, and then some rates of, of potential of neurotoxicity, um, which, <laughs> which are obviously uh, side effects that we can deal with, but, you know, can pose a problem for some patients. So the plus of the allogeneic product, from my standpoint, um, is that it's not on demand. It's available off the shelf. So if the patient uh, needs it, it can be given. And I think with, with the initial clinical data we saw from L0715, I think it was five days from signing consent to receive, to when they received wow. their L0 uh, CAR-T product. So very quick. Um, so that's okay. nice. So there's no need for any kind of bridging therapy which uh, you often need for autologous CAR Ts. Um, again, you can actually manufacture uh, uh, lots of product well before and stock it, so you're not dependent on, uh, on, on, on whether we have enough um, uh, of, the, of the substrates or, or whether, uh, you know, whether you have um, um, any kind of manufacturer glitches that may happen, um, as we've seen with some of the autologous CAR Ts. So there is less, less likely to be affected uh, by, by the viral transduction production uh, issues. Um, it's um, one of the other things that's interesting so far what we've seen is that um, the CRS and neurotoxicity seems to be less now compared to the autologous CAR T. And so the question becomes, of course, is that because we're not seeing the same expansion, um, which, is which is possible, or, or, mm -hmm. it's, you know, or, or it just seems to be sort of a, a lesser um, aggressive product, um, uh, but for some reason the toxicity uh, looks quite good from that standpoint. And then there's that potential that you could potentially uh, dose multiple times. Um, so with autologous CAR-T, um, that is a potential, but obviously there's a limit in how much you can redose um, because of, uh, uh, of the T-cell collection and how much was collected, whereas with with allogeneic product, in theory, you could give multiple doses, and some products are actually already doing that, uh, where they're actually sort of giving doses uh, uh, several times uh, to see if they can actually improve on, on the duration of those remissions. So, so there's, there's several reasons why allogeneic CAR Ts potentially could be better than an autologous CAR T, but they still have to be proven. Right. I think, um, you know, as I said earlier, like the, the two are already FDA approved, so they're a little bit ahead of the game compared to the aloes, and the aloes seem they're in clinical trials. So maybe we should talk about that. Um, can you outline the different CAR-T products that are in development? I think Posida has one, and then Allogene Therapeutics has one or multiple. Maybe I don't understand the differences between those. Um. Uh, yes, so, so there's actually um, uh, several, but um, the, 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 probably the, the one that's furthest ahead is, is the Allergen 715 product. Um, and so Allergen does have two um, um, uh, CAR Ts, um, but the one that's furthest ahead is Allo 715. Um, and so just to kind of back up a little bit, so, you know, like I said before, the, the, 
the allogeneic products have to be manipulated a lot more than the autologous product. Um, and so it's not just transducing the, the new DNA to create this car, but you actually have to go and disrupt genes in the T cells to, to remove things like the T cell receptor. And so, so a lot of these allogeneic products use uh, sort of different technologies to do so. And so you'll hear a lot about uh, things like CRISPR uh, and Talon, uh, which are probably the two most dominant ways to basically knock out uh, different genes uh, and putting uh, new genetic information. Uh, and so that's, that's, those are the technologies that I use the most. And so the, the ALO 715 product uses the Talon technology um, to remove the T cell receptor, which again, that will kind of help prevent uh, or minimize graft versus host disease. And then they also knock out CD52. And CD52, um, it's important uh, because it does sort of, it's one of the conduits for T cell rejection. So trying to prevent your own immune system from preventing the T cells. But the other thing it does is that CD52 is expressed on all T cells. And so, um, so they have another um, antibody, which they call ALO647. And that's why it's confusing. So ALO647 is not a CAR T. It's an actual antibody against CD52. Um, we have an antibody to, CD50, to, to CD52 called Campath uh, that was in the market for certain T cell lymphomas and for CLL. Um, and so that's, that's, that's still available, but this is sort of their own anti-CD52 antibody. And so the reason that's important is they can give this antibody to basically deplete to, to augment the lymphodepletion and deplete the patient's own T cells, but it doesn't kill the CAR T because the CAR T doesn't express CD52. Um, and so, and so in, in the allergene product, uh, they're giving uh, the flu psi, like we usually get for the autologous CAR Ts, uh, prior to giving the CAR T, but they're also giving this antibody for ALO647. Um, and, so, and so just kind of realize that. So one of the things that happens when you give CD52, however, is you get this very profound lymphodepletion. And one of the reasons CAMPAT um, was, was originally kind of removed from the market or sort of taken back was that it, 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 it induced such a profound lymphodepletion that lasted for so long that people started having lots and lots of infectious complications. And so that's one of the concerns about, uh, about using this kind of lymphodepletion um, that a lot of us are shy about and gun shy, especially in myeloma patients, because now you're really knocking out the T cells for a much longer time than the being does by itself with the autocar Ts, for example. So, so I think the important part here is going to be looking for whether they see any, any increase in infections or, or unusual infections. Uh, but that's sort of their strategy to, um, to sort of allow their CAR Ts to extend. Um, the, CRISPR Therapeutics also had uh, an allogeneic CAR-T um, using CRISPR, CRISPR technology, um, but that actually has, was in clinical trials, but that actually has been halted. Uh, so we'll, you know, we'll see why that was, but uh, presumably uh, they were not seeing the results they, they wanted to see. Um, and then uh, you mentioned um, Poseida. So Poseida um, has this... Um, uh, allergen A CAR T as well. And Poseida, what's very interesting about Poseida, uh, you, know, it's, you might have heard about Poseida because they had an autologous BCNA CAR T. Um, they're the only product that uses a non viral method to transduce their CAR T. So they actually use um, uh, this method, uh, this, uh, uh, this pig, piggyback technology that uses transposons to actually sort of kind of uh, introduce the new genetic. Uh, um, Information to the T cells, uh, and so that that's actually kind of that's actually kind of nice. So they're not dependent on, on sort of this viral um, uh, transduction, uh, potentially bypass sort of some of these issues, some of the autocar T cells. Um, and so and so we'll see. So this is very early on. The clinical trials are just starting. Um, you know the the autologous CAR T. The data we have from that um, looked interesting. There was expansion. There were some responses, uh, but the responses didn't seem durable, and they abandoned their autologous CAR T to go more with an allogeneic product. So, so we'll see what the uh, if their technology lends itself better to an allogeneic product. Um, 
And so, and so, so those are the, the more dominant products out there. Um, but there's definitely others that, you know, especially that target different, uh, uh, something other than BCMA as well. And yeah, I guess that would be. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> let's do that because so the the two that are FDA approved right now are both targeting BCMA, but you've got other um, other CAR Ts going after like CD19 or MCS1 or other targets like that, and then the bispecifics are adding even more targets like GPR, C5D, and other targets like that. Do are there are all the allos right now targeting BCMA, or do you see that? changing in the future that they might add some new targets? Yeah, no, it's, um, actually there's already an outlet that's going after a different target, um, uh, and I think there'll be more. So uh, UCAR CS1A is, uh, oh, is an allogeneic CAR T that targets CS1, which is the same target as um, elotizumab or implicity. Um, and so that's actually in clinical trials now, um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Because I agree, I think we need new targets. You know, the autologous CAR T's now, we have some um, uh, targeting uh, GPRC5D uh, as well. And I would be, I would, there's no, uh, to my knowledge, uh, there's no allo product going up to GPRC5D, but I suspect that that's coming as well. Um, as, you know, the, the target itself is important, um, but I think what's also becoming important is sort of kind of how do we, how do we maximize the options for patients uh, can we continue to just give BCMA products or do we have to go to different targets? And so I think it's important that we continue to explore and improve on the BCMA targeted therapies, but also just uh, to, um, to, to, to come up with uh, new products, new targets that hopefully can be complementary um, to each other and can be used potentially sequentially or even concurrently. And can you weigh in a little bit, and maybe this is both for auto and allo CAR-T, um, on, on dual targets, like trying to build a CAR-T that goes after maybe CD19 and BCMA or CS1 and BCMA. Are you seeing a lot of yeah. um, development in that area? And Do you think that's promising or do you not? No, I think that's very promising. So, um, so yeah, right now there there are dual targeted CAR-T. So, so it's the, originally, what we started seeing were people were using two different CAR T products to go to different targets, um, and so that's different uh, from an actual uh, dual targeted CAR T that is one CAR T product that just happens to have two CARs on it uh, and two different targets. So, so the one that's most advanced is uh, uh, it was just presented at ASCO this year from uh, China, where they actually target both BCMA and CD19. And CD19 is the target uh, that, uh, that is used a lot in lymphomas and in D-cell ALL because those cells express CD19. CD19 is not really expressed in myeloma cells, but it is thought to be expressed in sort of the early myeloma cells and maybe even the myeloma stem cells. And that's why sort of the rationale for using the CD19 CAR is that the BCMA could potentially sort of kind of uh, uh, debulk the tumor, and then maybe the CD19 can go and eradicate those cells to bring it back to myeloma, which which would be great, right? Um, and so that's the idea behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's definitely uh, you know potential, uh, and, and and CAR T sort of they're starting to look at going after two different uh, like BCMA and CD38, for example, or BCMA and GPRC5D at the same time. The idea being that perhaps the expression of the antigens may be different in any one cell, um, and so uh, and so the cells that are surviving um, either have downregulated uh, BCMA, for example, or or they just don't express it enough that they kind of were bypassed. Whereas if you actually have a different target, that different target would then go after those cells, um, and so you you could kind of. Uh, kind of similar to what we do with uh, using triplets or quadruplets, right, where we want to have different mechanisms mm -hmm. of targeting the cells and go after them uh, uh, via various, uh, in various ways. Um, but the, uh, the, if we're talking with the allogeneic products, actually the one that's, that's the most intriguing to me from that standpoint is the Posada product. So part of the, the problem with sort of as you – as you add more and more cars, and, and I told you all these manipulations that have to be done, you start sort of becoming genetically unstable and you're having to, you could, there's more potential for error and this 
it may not be enough room for some of these viral uh, trans um, uh, transfer methods uh, to 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 do or to carry out that that well. So whereas the piggyback method with the transposons, they actually uh, have shown that they can actually put up to five targets um, into their car uh, with this method. And so, um, so theoretically, um, uh, the, the, the Poseida um, technology may lend itself best to these sort of dual or triple targeted parties. Um, but yeah, obviously oh, wow. they haven't done it yet, so we'll have to see. Oh, that'd be amazing, but then you'd have to, you'd probably have to test them one at a time for safety, right? Like you keep adding one over yes. and over again. That's interesting. So can I ask you about CS1 as a target for CAR-T in general also? Because I know there are some for both auto and allo. So like you look at elotuzumab and by itself targeting CS1, it's really not that effective and you, they always combine it with lenalidomide or other products. Do you see the same thing happening for a CS1 um, CAR T that, um, or or it's just as good as a BCMA target? I guess you need data, yeah, right? No, it's, <laughs> but, I mean, it's, right? No, it's a great question. It's, um, I mean, you have to remember that the difference here, though, is that when you're talking about a monoclonal antibody, uh, so uh -huh. you know, Dar Selex, Amplicity. Um, is a uh, I'm like um, those, mm -hmm. those are antibodies, they bind to the target, but then they're dependent on, uh, on your own immune system to go after uh, and kill the cells via that antibody. And so uh, as opposed to CAR-Ts where the, the CAR itself ha is, is the, it's basically, you think of it as the antibody, that's the binding site, it's sort of like the antibody, but it is now um, uh, fused with this down signaling that activates that T cell. So it doesn't require a different part of the immune system to come and kill the antibody. The T cell already, as soon as it's engaged, is activated and kills the, the myeloma cell. And so, you know, there's a lot of questions as to why implicity doesn't work better than it does uh, by itself. Uh, and we know that CS1 is expressed on different NK cells and T cells. And so the idea is that perhaps sort of the binding of all these different parts of the immune system almost cancels each other out uh, in a way. So presumably the CAR T shouldn't have the same issue uh, because it's going to go after uh, cells that express CS1. And so what Eucardis has done is that they actually removed the CS1 expression on the CAR T um, so that uh, so that their car can actually go and almost like limpho deplete <laughs> uh, for them because hmm. T cells that normally would come after it would potentially be um, be a target for this car as well as myeloma. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see. But uh, but I think that's um, it's very it's the the targeting and the mechanism of actions is so different that it's hard to really know whether just because an antibody doesn't work doesn't mean a car T won't work. Okay, that's a great answer. Thank you so much, because I think that's a question that some patients might be interested in knowing. Okay, so if we, you know, like when you're thinking about using these different therapies or joining a clinical trial, the question is always like if I use something that's already targeting BCMA, like even an antibody drug conjugate like Blenrep or maybe a prior CAR-T targeting, can I go ahead and, is it going to be effective if I try to use this like an aloe product later? Like, could you fail or progress on a Becma and then use this, or could you use Blenrep and then use this? Um, do they even have that open in the trials? Is that an even a, even a possibility right now in some of those trials? Yeah, no, so those are great, great questions that unfortunately we don't have answers for. Um, mm -hmm. So some trials are starting to allow prior BCMA, but a lot mm -hmm. still don't. Um, and so the, you know, I think it's, I think you have to look at it two ways. So one is when you're trying to develop a new product, you want to sort of maximize the chances that it's an, it actually is effective. Um, and I think from that standpoint, I can see why, you know, a new sponsor that's just discovered this, BCMA-targeted product doesn't want to enroll just patients who have progressed on a BCMA 
product because we don't know why that patient right. progressed. That now, we know that there are different mechanisms of resistance, um, and most patients don't, or most patients' myeloma doesn't, doesn't seem to lose expression of ECMA, but we know that it can happen. Um, and that's the minority of people or, or, or cells, but, but it definitely can happen. And so if you lose BCMA, you now lost your target. This, this product's not going to be effective. So that's one of them. Um, yeah. The other is we don't know, um, again, sort of was it the, the T cell? Let's say you got a bispecific, like the clostamab against BCMA, uh, and you had a response and you progressed. Uh, and the question becomes, are you progressing because you've exhausted all the T cells? So then when you go and collect those T cells, are they not going to function anymore because they're exhausted uh, for an autologous product? That may not be the case for an allogeneic product, so perhaps this might work better. So, but at the same time, if, that, if that's not the case, uh, or if that wasn't the reason the person progressed, and it has more to do with the microenvironment and upregulation of certain inhibitory molecules, that will also inhibit the allogeneic CAR T. So, I think I think there's lots of reasons why a lot of these sort of new products don't necessarily want to tackle that from from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but uh, we're all the, the good news is that as more and more products are manufactured and and people and different sort of kind of different sponsors want to get a niche somewhere, um, we're starting to ask those questions. And so a lot of the uh, products now allow at least the cohort of patients to have had prior BCMA exposure to test that theory. Uh, so, so it's always important to just ask. Uh, the eligibility for all the trials is are complete. It seems like they're all the same, but they truly aren't. <laughs> so there are some specifics, um, uh, and so you just want to you just want to ask that question in particular. Um, I will. Yeah. I will sort of kind of, there was some very interesting data presented at ASCO this year um, with uh, the real world um, usage of ABECMA. I don't know if you saw that, um, but basically, you know, one of the concerns is, you know, does, does, the, does, does the clinical trial um, translate to the real world? And so several institutions kind of pulled the data together. And so they had, you know, uh, over 100 patients that have been treated with uh, commercial uh, ABECMA. Mm -hmm. And what's very interesting is that the sort of the response rates and the PFS that they saw were very similar to what was seen in KARMA, uh, the KARMA study. So that was reassuring. Um, what's uh, even further interesting is that I believe 75% uh, 70 of their patients would not have qualified for KARMA because of wow. various reasons. Uh, so that was also very interesting and reassuring. But what was a little bit, um, and it was a very small number of, patients, but when they looked at the patients who had prior BCMA therapies, um, including uh, by specifics on trial or, 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 or blend rep, um, the responses were less and the progression free survival was quite short. Uh, so again, this doesn't mean it doesn't work, but it kind of, it, it, it leads you to believe that should we be using these products if we have the option beforehand? Maybe until we find out more, I would try and stay away from them as much as possible. Yeah, so that means for patients, they have to be very careful about what they pick, you know, which clinical trial or which um, which therapy. That And maybe it's just a matter of access, you know, which one you can get, actually, because right. that's kind of yeah, the Yeah, no, I mean, unfortunately, right now, that but... is true. It's Sometimes, you know, we can't choose. Sometimes you can't. So, but I think it is a very important question, and, 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 and that's what I would take from this, because I don't want to scare people that they shouldn't be taking this or that, um, is that if they're being considered or considering a CAR-T, and it's really probably the, the immediate prior therapy that's more important. Um, if, mm -hmm. I don't think if you had sort of a BCMA therapy in first line because you were one of those people that were in that first study, you know, 10 years ago and got it then, and then 10 years later you're requiring a autologous BCMA CAR-T. I don't think that's, that applies to the to you. The problem here is that most people, unfortunately, are getting these all, you know, one after the other. Uh, and I think that's actually potentially important. But, again, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, but what I would, what I would, what I would urge uh, people is to – if a CAR-T is being contemplated before they go on to their next line of therapy, they should be talking to the CAR-T provider 
uh, to and work with their local doc if it's not the same person to try and minimize the potential or maximize the potential for a, a the best outcome possible. Uh, there are some things that perhaps maybe we should steer away if it looks like the next step is a CAR T. Now, yeah, that's so interesting. back to you know. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. Now, I was just going to say, so, and that's where sort of kind of having uh, different targets is helpful. So, you know, I've had, I've had the, the luxury of my patients that have uh, the luxury, I guess, of having uh, access to a lot of these clinical trials. And so I've had patients go from like a BCMA car to a GPRC5B by specific. I have another patient that went from a BCMA car to a GPRC5B uh, car several years later. Um, and so, and at least right now, in the AD, you know, this data is not out there, but we're very encouraged by the activity of these non-BCMA products, even if it's the same or similar technology. So, so perhaps moving to a different target actually may may obviate this question that we're asking right now, because right now every, the BCMAs are so far ahead. Mm, yeah, interesting. So do you want to talk about some of the data? You you mentioned a little bit about it, but um, like for the Allergene, CAR T, or some of the others, um, how does that? How, what what is the data? And I know comparisons are difficult, and you don't usually like to compare studies to studies. But just in general, are they are you seeing the same response rates and progression free survival and all the all those other things in the allo CAR T compared to the auto CAR Ts? Yeah, no, I, I, that's, I guess we could have started there. Uh, <laughs> So um, the truth is the, the clinical data that's been presented is, is pretty scant. So we don't have very much data to go, and we definitely don't have any long, longer-term data. So it's not too dissimilar, if you recall. You know, we make, we make fun sometimes of, 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 of some of these sponsors that seem to present sort of kind of a three-month update with every several meeting. But at the same time, it's nice to kind of see that progression, right, to see that, you know, those patients are closing mm -hmm. well. Um, and... Uh, and so, and so the allopartees are sort of in that infancy where they're just, you know, they're just presenting at least the, the only clinical data um, that is allopart T, to my knowledge, there are some NK data uh, out there, but uh, uh, it's, it's really the allo 715 uh, product. Um, and, and, they, and they just showed us data from their dose escalation. So this is where just trying to find their, their dose. So very few patients um, treated... Uh, I think it was like about 25 to 30 patients treated, but only about you know a dozen or so treated at the at the, what they considered to be active doses. Um, and and those patients they they reported response rates of about 60 to 70 percent, um, which is actually quite good because they were they were not they had not completed the dose escalation. So so not too dissimilar from what we're seeing with the bi specifics. Um, it's not mm -hmm. too it's maybe. You know, we'll see with more numbers whether that actually looks better. So I think it's similar to what we're seeing with uh, with the Beckner, maybe not as good as we're seeing with some of these other things like uh, Arcelex and uh, and uh, uh, Carvicti, which are in the high 90s and 100% response rates. Um, but I think re reasonable response rates. But we don't know anything about um, about PFS. We don't know anything about sort of the duration of that response. Uh, I think the furthest outpatient they had was like a – seven or eight months or so, um, but most of them oh, were yeah. like within no, no, no. Three, most of them were within like three months of therapy. So, so we really don't know anything about them. And, and, that's, and that's the important part in my mind is, is whether these products are going to be less or the responses are going to last as long as what we see with the autologous CAR T. Um, just because, you know, with the, with the best specifics, obviously you keep getting the product. And so, if, if we don't see the same sort of duration of the response, then the question or that potential to, to for redosing becomes important, and, 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 and perhaps maybe the allocar teeth have to be dosed like every six months uh, or something to that effect to kind of keep keep that going. But I guess we'll see. Yeah, that's so interesting. I know that when they did uh, like redosing of some of the autocar teeth, it didn't seem to like be that effective, but maybe that right. there's, I mean, there, this whole field is evolving so fast that, correct. yeah, yeah, maybe so, that's so going to be great. You are correct. You are, you are correct that um, at least with the, 
uh, with Idacel and Sotacel, so Abecline and Pervicti, the uh, retreatment doesn't, doesn't seem to be beneficial. Now, one of the potentials there is that, um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Abecma is, is, a, is a nearing chim chimera, so that means that there's actually some mouse of proteins in the, uh, in the car itself. Uh, and then Carvicti is what they call a camelid, which is, it has some lama protein um, in the car. And so uh, you're, when the cars are introduced into, into the patient, the patient actually can make antibodies against those foreign proteins. And so we know that with the autologous CAR Ts, uh, there is uh, an increase uh, of these, what we call anti-CAR antibodies. And so one of the potential thoughts is that what happens is if you give the CAR T again, and you have these antibodies, these antibodies kill the CAR-T very quickly and you don't allow it to expand. Um, and so, and so with, the, you know, with the allogeneic product, um, you know, that could be the same thing, especially if they're using sort of, again, mirroring chimerisms, et cetera. The, most of them are humanized or actually synthetic products, so it's possible that we will not see that. But the other thing is that it kind of depends on when you give the CAR-T. So the retreatment for the autologous CAR T's was at the time of progression. And so the thought would be, can you oh, give yeah. a product before progression in, in a particular sort of sequence uh, that will allow you to sort of maintain that remission? Uh, and I think that's a different uh, potential. But, but those are the caveats of retreatment. Uh, so yes, there is a potential that retreatment will not work with the other products either. Well, that makes a lot of sense that you would do it before you have a problem to deal with <laughs> and keep right. the keep the disease in check. So I have a question about side effects. Um, you mentioned that you seem to see lower side effect profile, like for cytokine release syndrome or for some of the neurotoxicities. Is that the case? And then um, are there any new side effects, like do you see the graft-versus-host disease or GVHD like you do an allo transplant for these patients, or because they did all the manufacturing enhancements ahead of time, you just don't see any of that. Yeah. So, well, I'll start with the easy question. So, the easy, the easy, or the easy answers. The, uh, so, GVHD is not being seen. So, that's that's good because okay. again, that would be actually catastrophic. Um, so, yeah. so none of the uh, products seem to be, they, they they were very good at removing the TCR uh, receptors. So. Um, so we're not seeing that. Um, the, the actual graph versus, uh, the cytokine release syndrome uh, and neurotoxicity is interesting. So with all of these allogeneic products, uh, both in uh, myeloma and then lymphoma, but actually it's a little more ahead of us, where you're using allogeneic uh, either NK cells or allogeneic T cells, the rates of cytokine release syndrome are actually quite low. And with ALO715, I think it was 40, like 40%. Um, and, and it's even lower in some other products. Um, and all our grade one, very few grade twos, no grade threes or fours, and really no neurotoxicity. Um, and so <clears throat> the question, of course, immediately becomes, is it because the cells are not expanding uh, to the same degree that autologous T cells can expand, and or the cells are just not persisting as long, and they very quickly uh, get removed by the patient's own immune system. Because uh, we know that, that those side effects of cytokine release and neurotoxicity uh, correspond to, to the expansion of T cells. So the patients that get the largest expansions and who may actually then have uh, persistence of their CAR-T at high levels tend to be the ones that have the most toxicity as well. So, so it's one over the other. And so the hope is that, it's, that it, the expansion is sufficient to see activity um, and the, the persistence is sufficient to see that activity because it's still unclear whether you have to persist to maintain your remission. So hopefully that's not the case because I think that's what's going to happen with the other products. We'll see less expansion and, and a decreased persistence. But the idea is that hopefully you get such a deep, immediate response that you don't need to persist. Um, but if it's if it's not, if it's not a sufficient response and they're you know the cells are being removed quickly, then that could lead to not as effective response as we did tell this So again, 
we, we just need to see the data. But, but yes, definitely the, the cytokine lease and neurotoxicity seems to be less with the other products. Um, infections is something to keep an eye on, like I said before, especially yeah, yeah. Uh, because the, in efforts to try and, and really uh, suppress the patient's immune system so that it doesn't destroy the allogeneic RTs, uh, a lot of these allo uh, products are using uh, lymphoid depletion that's much more aggressive than what we see with the autologous parties, which can have its own consequences as well. So we'll have to see if we can find the fine line of when is too much too much uh, or if not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, I want to give a little time to caller questions. And um, if we don't have caller questions, I have several more questions for you. So if you want to ask Dr. Berdeha a question, you can call 347 637 Two six three one and press one on your keypad. And while we're waiting to see if we have any questions, um, well, you mentioned one of my questions was about the time frame, but you kind of already addressed that. Okay, so we have a caller that ends in number seven four zero one. Go ahead with your question. All right, thank you. Yes, I'm just um, wondering. What the need? Why you need lympho depleting chemo before a CAR T? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Um, so so it's when when you give a CAR T, um, you there's only so many so many T cells are you giving back, right? So you have a lot more T cells in your body, and so the idea here is that T cells are always going to be competing against each other, and so you give the lympho depleting chemo to decrease the number of T cells in your body that are circulating so that when you give the CAR Ts, they're not competing against each other to go after the myeloma because you want these CAR Ts to see the myeloma, go after it, and expand. Uh, and so that's the reason for the lymphodepletion. There actually are some studies. Um, uh, CAR Ts originally were done without lymphodepletion or with a different lymphodepletion that was not as aggressive, and the expansion of the CAR Ts was much less, and they were not as effective. So unfortunately, we, right now we do need the lymphodepletion, but we're all trying to figure out how to minimize or how to improve on the lymphodepletion so it doesn't have some of the potential longer-term side effects that we're seeing in some people where blood counts stay suppressed for a long time and infections. But, yeah, great question. All right. Thank okay. you. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks for the question. And um, I guess a follow-up question on that is you mentioned that, you know, these are these allocartes are engineered to knock out the CD52. So do you use the same dose of the fludarabine and the cytoxin and, and all that? Um, or you, they're probably just going to learn over time maybe if if it goes ends up being too much. Right. So um, right now uh, we are using the same dose, and that's because uh, the first dose levels only use the – so they're leading cytoxin, and it was seen that the expansion was not what was hoped for, and that's when the antibody, the LO647, was added. So it was just added to the lymphodepletion. It wasn't instead of. So, so, yeah, so right now it's a three, but I think that's an excellent question. Is, is the antibody sufficient that maybe you don't need the chemotherapy at all? Um, uh, but, yeah, I think that's, it's going to be one of those things where you're just going to have to try uh, to attenuate. Um, but... But you know, but but it's it's hard, I think, for for a CAR T product to to sort of test because that requires testing a whole bunch of new patients in those levels if you make too many right. changes. So so sometimes, unfortunately, once kind of once you start with something and it's working, uh, it stays until a separate study or somebody else yeah. decides to tackle it on. Right, that makes sense. There's a lot that goes into these this right. clinical trial design development. Of right. So much. Okay. Another. Yes. Go ahead. No, I was just going to oh, say, no, in terms okay. of depletion, that's, that's one of the reasons why, because uh, you know, patients often ask, you know, why can't they get a CAR T because their, you know, their kidneys are not working, and and one of the reasons for that is that fludarabine um, is excreted through the kidneys, and so if if your kidney function is not, uh, uh, is, is is too poor, we can't give the fludarabine, and we don't know what it means to whether the cells will expand without fludarabine. So just realize that, that's, that, that sometimes some of the exclusions are for a reason, um, but unfortunately sometimes the reason is we just don't know. Yeah, okay, great. We have another caller question that ends in 4085. Go ahead with your question. 
Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, this has been a fascinating presentation, and you mentioned that the CAR T's use viral vectors. Are there availability issues for the allo CAR T's in addition to the auto CAR T's? Are there availability issues? Is that what you said? Yes, availability issues for the allo CAR T's in addition to the auto CAR T's. Right. Um, so, uh, it, the, theoretically, there are, except except that um, the, you know, like we discussed a little bit before, the autologous CAR T's are on demand, right? So, if you were getting an autologous CAR T, uh, I collect your T cells, and then they have to be manufactured. You need to have that vector available to create those CAR T's. With the allogeneic CAR T's, um, the donor is separate from the patient, and so you can actually take one donor and manufacture hundreds of products, and they're frozen and they're ready to go. So when you need your CAR T, that's already made. Uh, so because you don't have that on-demand uh, feature, uh, it, it, they're not as uh, susceptible uh, to to availability of the viral um, transduction uh, process. So 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 less so, but yes, theoretically they could be. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks for the question. I think um, this whole viral vector issue is interesting because, like, all these COVID vaccines have used these viral vectors, so maybe there's why there's this big kind of global shortage, I think. I don't know. No, um, I think so. I okay, think last question. Right I think it's, I asked a question. Keep going. No, 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 Your go ahead. Your questions are more interesting. No, oh, I no, I want to hear you comment on that. <laughs> All this, all the supply stuff and everything affects us as well, right? And there's a lot of shortages in medicines and so forth. So I'm not surprised the viral uh, vectors are being affected as well. Yeah, interesting. Well, last question. I guess one of two questions, and you can pick which one you answer. So, where is CAR T headed, in your opinion, to extend remissions? Like we were talking, you were talking earlier about, about like some of your patients using bispecifics before or after, or using them in the earlier lines of therapy, or these new allo therapy options, or using maintenance. Um, so, where do you see the field headed in general? And then, just if you have any CAR T open trials that you want to mention. Um. Yeah, no, great, great question. So I think we're all we're all very interested uh, in, in in taking the CAR T's to earlier lines of therapy um, uh, because we know most myeloma therapies work better earlier in the course than later. So it makes sense that this would happen, especially with the autologous CAR T's. Right, uh, we're, we're worried about certain therapies impacting uh, the T cell function, and so the, the less heavily treated the patient, perhaps the better. Um, and so a lot of studies are already ongoing uh, looking at CAR T's even in the first line and then one to three prior lines. And so we're going to have some data at ASH actually potentially with uh, uh, at least one of the randomized uh, trials in uh, one to three prior lines of therapy uh, using CAR T against standard of care, for example. So, so, so lots coming our way. But personally, I think CAR T's are so powerful and I think, I think we under, I think we, we, we don't know, but I believe that they're so powerful that they actually can detect very minimal residual disease. And so in my mind, um, I would like to see CAR T being tested and used in the minimal residual disease setting, trying to use mm -hmm. them as, as a means to really wipe out that residual disease. Um, at the, other, the other advantage of that is that we know that patients with high tumor burden who get the CAR T's often are the ones that have the most toxicity. And so theoretically in that setting, that would be much less toxic. Um, and so that's what I would like to see. And there are some studies now looking at, uh, at the post-transplant setting or after induction uh, sort of patients under control given the CAR T's. So, so those are the ones I'm most intrigued by. Um, in terms wow. of uh, trials, uh, obviously we, we have quite a few trials, and we have a lot of these uh, trials yeah. with the BECMA and COVID-T and the early lines of therapy, including frontline uh, and high-risk patients, uh, and actually uh, as consolidation after transplantation. So, uh, so kind of keep an eye for for those. We, there's also a couple autologous uh, CAR T products that are looking very impressive. One is CTO53, and the other one is the product from our Celex. Uh, which showed a 100% response rate. So those two are sort of the next two autologous CTMA CAR T's coming down, and 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 they they differ in that CTO53 is human, so it doesn't have uh, mouse or llama, 
And we talked about the antibodies, so potentially they would have decreased potential for that in terms of destroying the CAR T. Our cell actually uses a completely synthetic um, binding site, so uh, theoretically it's not immunogenic as well. And so those are available in the relapse refractory setting uh, with us. And then we have several CAR T trials with allogeneic CARs, including L715, L605, Ricardus, and several NK CARs. So, so lots of CAR Ts in the serotonin. Uh, yeah, you you've been prolific in doing in running these CAR T studies. So, this show has been so enlightening um, on the allo product uh, idea in general, but also just in CAR T in general. And I think if patients, I think what you're saying is really important about like thinking ahead, getting on a waiting list, um, looking into clinical trial participation early, and kind of positioning yourself to take advantage of some of these newer therapies because it takes a long time for them to get um for them to get approved and and these allos are very early like you mentioned and um sometimes there's an availability issue so it might be almost easier to get into the trial versus getting it you know as an approved therapy uh, i don't know without a question i can tell you that my patients that we have on the wait list for commercial products we usually can get them into a clinical trial faster Oh, well. so, so definitely continue to support with clinical trials. Um, and, and I'll just put a plug that, you know, I still have a patient who was at the very first, uh, the CRB-401, which is the, the phase one trial prior to calling up for, for a BECMA, um, who is still in remission. She's about five and a half years now. So oh, all therapy that's for fabulous. Five and a half. So, so, so she had access to it way before we even were dreaming that this would be a commercial product. Yeah, I agree. I think patients should consider CAR-T at every stage and uh, clinical trials at every stage of therapy. So, And that's one of the tools that's in that Health Tree Cure Hub um, product that I talked about as a clinical trial finder that you can find personalized things. So, Dr. Berdeja, thank you so much for everything you do for CAR-T and for myeloma patients in general. I know you're running many more studies beyond just CAR-T. So thank you for being a leader in this field. We just appreciate you so much. Uh, you're welcome, and I appreciate all of you. And yes, please reach out to to um, your local docs, to your uh, your your transplanters, to your to your research docs, or to me, to whomever you can. Through uh, obviously the crowd, the Melma crowd has such great resources for you. But uh, definitely seek out those clinical trials because I think that 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 opens up significant avenues for you for treatment. But thank you so much yeah, for having me. I always enjoy talking to you, smile on the crowd. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for, for for joining. We really appreciate you so much. And we thank our listeners for listening to this new Health Retreat podcast for Multiple Myeloma. Um, join us next time to learn more about what's happening in myeloma research and what it means for you. Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper, a woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver? I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.